Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the interviews that we're going to do for the City Council at Large. Today's Thursday, June 13th. Uh, it's 5.30 p.m. and they're going to bring up the first person to be interviewed. These interviews will go approximately 20 minutes each. And we should be done with them an hour and a half, two hours. With any, any luck? As we go through this, uh, first to be interviewed will be Colleen Clark, then Anita Kofer, Brett Boston, Chris Nickel, and Alexander Magatu. Hello, Ms. Clark. Please come up and turn your mic on. And Was already on. There we go. Great. Good. <laughs> it's great to see you. Thank you for uh, uh, applying for this position. I'll tell you how the process is going to work. We each submitted two questions each. Mm -hmm. So there's six of us. There'll be 12 questions asked of you. Okay. You have about two minutes on every question, and then we'll move to the next one. And if you don't have to use your two minutes, you can you can answer how you want to answer, and then. Uh, we'll move on. I don't know. Okay. Two minutes to answer a question about Pueblo. You're going to have to call time on me. <laughs> there you I'd go. Love, there you go. To talk about it. So we're going to start with uh, Councilor Latino. Good evening, Colleen. Good evening, Joe. Please share with us your background and explain what similarities it has with your role as a city councilman citywide? Joe, I'm first generation. Uh, my father came from Yugoslavia. My mother was uh, from Ireland. They came via Ellis Island and they came to Pueblo because it was a big steel mill, big draw for the immigrants. I was raised on the uh, south side, went to uh, Jefferson Elementary all the way up through Central High. I'm proud Wildcat, go Cats. Um, I've been involved in the city since I retired, came back in, uh, I believe it was 2016. And um, I love Pueblo. M my roots are here. Matter of fact, this picture here is a picture of my grade school companions. We get together at the high school reunion to have our Jefferson Elementary girls club. <laughs> so I, my roots are really deep here in Pueblo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Martinez. Hi, Ms. Clark. Hi. Tell us about why you have decided to apply for the at-large seat. Well, I love Pueblo and I love this community. And I thought, you know, I have a lot of uh, things that I could bring to the table. Some of my little wisdom and some other things that I've experienced through life. I've uh, been retired now oof, about 10 plus years. I did a lot. I mean, my career spans from being a CNA to being an optometrist. It just spans the globe. And I thought I could bring that to the table. 
And I absolutely love this city. I think Pueblo is on the cusp of becoming something amazing. And I wanna be here for the, the children, the future. I know I had to leave in the, I mean, everybody's had to leave Pueblo. In 82, I think it was a steel mill industry kind of went down, we fell into poverty in Pueblo and everybody had to kind of split up. Nobody wants to leave their hometown, their friends and come back. Unfortunately, my children had to leave because there were no jobs. And I would love nothing better than to see this city grow to where my granddaughter can come back to where I was born and raised. Did I get it under two minutes? <laughs> The uh, next question comes from me. <clears throat> in preparation for your appointment, have you read the city charter? And if so, can you describe its importance to the role of being a counselor? So in the city charter, I, I went over that as I did the city budget too. And part of council, we are here to represent the people. And the at large particularly is to represent all the districts and to represent our community, to bring the people together, to do what is right for the people as far as we cover the budget on the police, the fire, um, we should be open and transparent. That's all within the the charter and what they say about in, you know what we should be as leaders in the city of Pueblo. I'm not quite sure whether you wanted me to um define the charter or explain it or no it was just have you read it yes yes i read that and... i also read actually in my resume was part of the oath of the council members the whole thing and up to i kind of added to it when i said i'm definitely a visionary that was straight off the the city website thank you mm -hmm. uh Councilor Maestri. Hi. Hello, Colleen. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Um, it takes a lot of courage to come forward and want to represent your community. It's not easy. So yes, thank you does. for taking that step. And I haven't interviewed in decades, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, please describe the differences between the duties of the mayor and of council as written in the charter. Okay, so the... Council basically oversees boards and commissions. The mayor oversees the city. We, if say there's an adopted budget and we go we go through the budget or whatever, then it goes. The mayor looks at it, then it comes back. Well, and then we look at it, and then it goes, and, and it's approved. So the mayor basically runs the police department, the fire department, all the city offices and whatnot. We oversee the boards and commissions. And of course, we pass agendas. We work on the agendas and work on ordinances and codes. Mm -hmm. I think that's about, I don't want to over explain it, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Flores. Welcome, Mrs. Clark. Thank you thank for you. being here. Uh, my question is as follows How do you see your skills and personality fitting? Uh, on this dais with the rest of the city council? Well, I'm a people person. I love all people. And I'm always willing to hear everybody's ideas. And I'm always willing to step up if someone can't or is unable to. I'm willing to help in every way I can. I'm willing to be absolutely nonpartisan on all matters because that's what I believe. I think everybody brings something to the table. And I'd like to be that thread that pulls it all together. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Councilor Gomez. Hi, how are Hi. you? Good, how are you? One of these years, okay. How do you approach working with others who have different viewpoints or priorities? We're all human, we're all individual. Nobody's gonna say, think exactly the same. and. Sometimes if we quiet ourselves and listen to the other person, maybe their views are closer to our views than we realize. So I'm willing to listen to anybody and hear them out and willing to have a discussion with them and see where they're coming from and try to understand what they're trying to do or accomplish. 
Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Martinez. Tell us about a time where you had to work to build consensus. What were the strategies that you used and were you successful in getting consensus? Okay, I've been I've been in management and I've had employees and let me tell you, when employees decide they don't like each other, it gets ugly. So you have to bring them to the table and you have to discuss what is the root problem between them? What, what are we looking at that is causing the differences? I think you have to be open-minded and be able to hear people out and see all sides of that story. I think it's part of just being human to listen to each other and come to some kind of agreement or the world will never function until we do. And I think it's very important in council to understand each other and try to hear each other's views. Uh, Councilor Gomez. What are the top three policy issues you believe our community should focus on and how would you address them? Well, I think you guys are starting to um, address some of the issues. And um, I think beginning with some of the policies as far as kind of getting some of the people off the streets that are holding signs or obstructing traffic. I mean, we have, we've got to think about the people and the protection of them, whether or not that particular policy or ordinance will work. It doesn't matter. It's a beginning and a step forward. And you said you wanted three yes. policies. Oh boy. Um, that have been passed within the last three months because you passed the uh, no camping, you passed the needle, which is under a restraining order right now. And then I think you passed the, uh, there was one, um, there was another ordinance that I believe you Well, passed. you can address those three if you want. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll, all right. I'll, I'll address them. I think that um, the ban on ca homeless camping, I, I get it and I understand it. And I understand the needle ban. However, what I would have done prior to all of that is to make sure that all services were already implemented and ready to go. It's kind of like make sure that there was a full functioning homeless shelter, maybe full functioning organizations to go from homeless to uh, housing. I think that um, as long as you have the organizations in place, then you can put some of these ordinances in place. As far as the needle exchange, I would have made sure that there was an open table discussion prior to that. And I would have maybe considered where you were legally in a stance of the, what you could do legally when approaching something like that. And I think we have to make sure that when we go out and try to band or stop something that we have something to replace it. Okay. I think we, we you just can't shut off a valve unless you have another valve to open. Thank you. Councilor Flores. <clears throat> what does the term nonpartisan mean to you? Nonpartisan means to me that you don't stand sturdy on just one side of the issue. That means to me that you look at both sides and you're not willing to stand hard on just one side of it. You're not going to, you just not going to say I'm absolutely here at this point. I'm not going to cross that aisle. I think nonpartisan, you're in the center, you're willing to look at both sides of that aisle and understand where both sides are coming from. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Meister. Um, Colleen. Yes. Uh, the chieftain came out this morning saying that they were going to require request all the applications. Uh -huh. And um our votes, how we voted to get everyone here tonight. Uh -huh. And so for transparency for public reasons, um there was a um there was some accusations made of cronyism and predetermination mm -hmm. and favoritism. So I'm gonna ask each one of the candidates to explain your relationship with each member of council. And tell us if you believe the relationship should be a reason um, that they should recuse themselves from the vote tonight. You know, Pueblo, Pueblo's not 
New York City, everybody knows somebody that knows somebody. Mm -hmm. It's we're a tight knit community like that. <laughs> and I don't think I honestly don't think that you guys are the type to sit around and decide before you've heard everybody out. I think that you've been balanced and fair in the past, and I think you'll be balanced and fair in the future. And I think people are going to talk, you know, they're, they're going to believe in stories. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's small town mentality. And do I believe it's true? No. Well, I didn't ask if it was true. I asked oh. you to explain your relationship oh. with um, each member uh, of council. And if you feel that that might be a reason for them to recuse themselves from voting. No. Okay. Short answer. No. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Latino. <clears throat> Colleen. Yes. This community is trying to move forward. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about the needle exchange? Okay. I think that eventually we have to get those needles off the, the streets, just simply because it's become somewhat of a public hazard. But I think that we have to figure out, I think the better way would be stop the flow of drugs. And I think that we need to look at that program, go to the table with them, because from what I understand that even diabetics can get needles from their people that have diabetes. So I think we need to bring it to the table have a discussion with them, tell them, look, this has become a problem. We've got needles everywhere. We need to get them cleaned up. We need to follow certain ordinance within the city. And I'm going to be frank with you, Mr. Latino. I don't think that a needle exchange should be close to anywhere there are children. It should be somewhere where it's not right next to a school or where there's kids coming in and out of that area. But I think that we have to look at other ways of approaching things. And we have to figure this out somehow, either as a community or if the council is willing to bear that weight as a council. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I have the last question. Mm -hmm. So you insinuated that you looked over the 2024 budget. Yes. <laughs> In what areas would you suggest reducing expenses to help alleviate the $13 million budget deficit? I would say um, look at the amount of money being given to nonprofits. I know that's a real dagger in the, to the nonprofits, but I think that we have to not be given 25000 here and 50000 here. I think that we need to kind of uh, scale that down a little. And I think we could look at maybe if we're going to talk budget, maybe look at some of the capital improvement projects that have been finished, see if there's any funds left there that we could allocate somewhere else. It'd be a one-time thing, but they may be there and we may be able to utilize them. For sure. Thank you. <clears throat> so again, thank you for oh. going through this okay. process. You can stay here okay. in the the uh, auditorium and okay. go through the rest. You don't have to go be sequestered any longer. Oh, okay. Uh, but we appreciate your participation thank you. and thank, uh, you. thank you so thank much. You. Hello, Ms. Kofer. Come on down. Once again, thank you for uh, participating and, and wanting to be a part of this. Yes. And uh, 
each of us, what's a little different than last time is that each of us have submitted two questions. So you're going to get 12 questions instead of just six. Okay. Uh, we'll do the same time deal where you have a couple minutes on every question. You don't have to take two minutes. You can answer however you want. Uh, but we we want to make sure we get it done in about 20, 24 minutes. Sounds I think you're good with that, huh? There you go. Uh, we're going to start with Councilor Latino. Please share with us your background. Please share your background with us and explain what similarities it has with your role as a city council citywide representative. You said I only had 20 minutes. <laughs> so my background, um, I've been in business for myself over 30 years. I'm an international pastor. I've been um, clergy for the Emerald Police Department for about 12 years. I'm still an honorary um, clergy at the Emerald Police Department. I am in, uh, see, I'm a licensed insurance agent. I'm a licensed and certified tax uh, representative. So I've been doing taxes, uh, commercial and personal, six or seven years now. Been in the life insurance business for quite some time. I deal with executive bonuses, retirement plans, people's uh, wills, last will and testament, uh, budgets uh, for clientele. Let's see, what am I missing here? So Summarizing, how would that work uh, for me as a city council representative? Number one is coming in with the knowledge that I have. The city's budget is huge. Uh, the last time I didn't do my full homework on the city's budget, but since the last interview, uh, I actually have made myself aware of that and just kind of even looked around to see and play with <clears throat> if I was elected, how would I even what gifts and attributes do I have that could be brought to the table that could kind of forge the community forward better? So having an understanding of businesses, having, I'm also the NAACP's um, economic development chair. So understanding the economics of the community, um, sitting on, you know, the CSAC board, uh, certain boards, having an understanding of the, the inner dwellings of Pueblo and the community that I live in. Everything that I do as far as a businesswoman, uh, I believe will be will play a huge role in a part as a representative of the council if elected. Thank you. Councilor Martinez. Hi, Ms. Gilbert. Hello. Tell us about why you decided to apply for the outlawed seat position. Kind of echoing on the heels of what I just said, um, the experience, the knowledge, the professionalism, the uh, nonpartisan mentality being able to bring a little bit of um, some of my experience and diversifying that a little bit, being an outside person. I often talk to people and they ask me, you know, um, am I a Puebloan? And I said, I am now. Six years in, I am a Puebloan, not born and raised. However, uh, the community in a whole means a lot to me. I relocated majority of my family here. Three out of four of my children are here and seven out of 15 of my grandchildren are here. Several of them have been born here in, in Pueblo. So why not apply? Uh, because I want to make sure that the Pueblo it is today is not the Pueblo that it is tomorrow for my grandchildren that are growing up in this town. And being able to bring some of the attributes, bring some of the changes, bring um, maybe some innovative ideas and collaborating with the current administration on moving forward is one of the reasons why I continue to tip my hat in the race. Next question is mine. <clears throat> in preparation for your appointment, have you read the city charter? Actually, I have it downloaded onto my phone. Um, so I have been going over the uh, city charter. I've been going over the roles. Great. Um, of a city council member as well. So can you explain its importance to the role of being a city councilor? We work for the, just to summarize, we are for the people 
and the taxpayers' dollars. And it's our responsibility to make you know, the, the best decisions to uphold our positions. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to be very honest tonight. I was like, I, I almost not chose not to come because I got so many different emails and things. What I've seen as a whole uh, for city council, we've had, you know, it's not a perfect um, forum. We have uh, differences and it's expressed amongst the, the council over the years that I've been attending city council and what have you. One of the things that I would really, really like to stand for is those core values and being able to make sure that as a city representative, adhering to those principles. I mean, it's Mark, it's very serious. Like I wouldn't keep pitching my hat in this race if I didn't feel like the position of a city councilman, especially the at-large seat, needs someone who's going to be able to stand firm and not waver and not have um, partial partiality, favoritism, or any hidden agendas when it comes to serving the people of Pueblo and looking out for their tax dollars that they work so hard for. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Maestri. Hi, Anita. Thanks for coming. No problem. It, it takes a lot of courage to step up and glad to see you here. Good to see you. Um, so please describe the differences between the duties of mayor and of council as written in the charter. So, so the duties of the mayor, which by the way, I'm really glad uh, to see all the great things that our new mayor is doing. So hats off to you. Um, and the operations that she runs. And as city council, to me, um, you know, as I was even looking over uh, that charter, it, it really is a collaboration of right hand, left hand. We have to work directly with uh, the mayor when and looking at the, um, you know, the bigger picture of our city. Now, as a city council, there's a huge responsibility the weight on the shoulders of a city councilman is heavy, just like the weight of a, of a mayor is heavy. Now, the direct dialogue, because I just started downloading this and going through that, um, I'm not going to say I have the direct dialogue, but if I could paraphrase it, that's why, how I'm going to paraphrase it. Uh, we have a huge responsibility. You all have a huge responsibility as city councilmen to uh, make the right decisions. Uh, also to be able to lean and stand firm, grounded, if it is something that the mayor was wanting to move forward that didn't agree, uh, wasn't but for the greater good of the people. And at the end of the day, uh, Regina, it has to be for the greater good of Pueblo, not for the greater good of the council people, not for the greater good of the mayor, but it has to be for the greater good of Pueblo in a whole. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Flores. Thank you. You have Mike. Welcome, Mrs. Cobra. I'm happy to see you here. Uh, my question is, how do you see your skills and personality fitting into this dais of this council? Uh, the calm in the middle of the storm. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, me fitting in. So concerning budget concerning things that we want to move forward, innovative ideas, concerning the economic growth of the city, concerning uh, combating the, the crime, you know, the safety of our citizens of the community. My mother calls me the jack of all trade and the master of most, simply because once I get vested in something and once I get involved in something, I do my best to be very proficient and what I do and how I serve and every area of what my professional life is about and including my personal life because it comes with character. It comes with the values, the core values that has instilled, has been instilled in me throughout these 50 years of my life. So it comes with that. It comes with knowledge. It comes with wisdom. And when you pair all of that collectively together and you bring it to the table, uh, it's a perfect fit for the council 
and where you all are. Um, I would not see a conflict of interest with anyone working with anyone on the panel. I sit and watch you guys, even if I'm not in person, I'm on the phone. I have learned to know a lot of your personalities and how you work and how you think and how you view the things of the city concerning the city. And I would not have an issue working with either one. And being able to have someone who is not partial to the right or partial to the left is what this council needs. Uh, <clears throat> Councilor Gomez. Hi, hey, Anita. Hello. How do you approach working with others who may have different viewpoints or priorities? God gave us two ears and one mouth. We have to first listen. We have to be willing to hear the other side before we're just quick to try to push our own agenda. That was a core values that I was talking about when you're, that was what was raised uh, and instilled in me. And I was raised with that uh, conflict can start with you and it can also end with you. You always have to be willing to be the bigger person. You're not going to always be right. No one's right 100% of the time. So if there's conflict, you first have to hear what the conflict is. You have to get to the bottom, the root of the, the core problem of what it is. And then you have to be willing to meet someone halfway in the middle. Compromise is something that everyone on this panel has to do at some point. And you can't always be the winner. Thank you. Councilor Martinez. So tell us about a time that you had to work to build consensus. What were the strategies that you used to build consensus and were you successful? Yes. And I was thinking about, I had a few, um, I had a few things and I was like, I wanted to make sure that I was um, very thorough this time because there is just so much that I could share with you. But one of the stories I wanted to share with you, I felt like was very important. So I typed it out and I typed my notes this time too, because I was like, Regina, you caught me off guard the last time. <laughs> I was like, take your notes, Anita. So <laughs> oh no, and it, and it's okay, but but again, what I learned uh from the first time was preparation, you know, um, and that's one of the things, preparation and skill. Uh, whenever you come to the forum, when you come to the the front of anything, you need to come prepared. And there's a lot of things that we can do off the top of our head, but preparation is key. Mm -hmm. However, one of the times that I wanted to share uh, with you and, and the consensus of what we were, we were having conflict with is within the organization, we were looking to do some expansion uh, with the homeless community there in Amarillo, Texas. So I sat on a board, um, We it was a ministry board. And whether you're, it's ministry or not, there's always going to be times when not everyone is seeing eye to eye. And we really wanted to start combating a lot of the homeless um, problems that we were having there. Uh, at that particular time, we didn't have the camping like what we have here in Pueblo, but it was getting to the point where it was. So we needed to come together and we needed to create a plan and we're dealing with the tight budget we're dealing with not everyone being on the same page of even wanting to um you know it was with the uh, tyler resource center we also worked with the uh, salvation army on the deal along with two church organizations now tight budgets <laughs> Um, that was one of the things I guess I probably should have said in the beginning too, because it causes conflict. It causes confusion. Um, some people see that money should be spent in one way and others see that it should be spent in another. And with this, I believe one of the things that I was able to really, really add um, to this situation was the innovative ideas that I came up with that listening to others was able to grasp hold from one 
set of people and another set of people and create uh, an entire system that actually worked and it continues to work within the Tyler Resource Center today uh, when they're dealing with their homeless people. They're effectively running out of uh, the Resource Center, those uh, programs that we were able to put together and they're still running till this day. And so I think it's probably been about 12 years now that they started that. Councilor Gomez. You believe our community should focus on and how would you address them? A lot of stuff is actually kind of in the works. So when I began to uh, look at where we needed um, the work and like what I would focus my attention on, it's actually four things, but I will break it down to the three. The fiscal responsibility, I it was my number one, okay? Because without a budget, we can't really do anything. Addressing our $50 million plus debt um, requires careful and transparent management. And I believe, you know, dealing with other people's money requires responsibility and management. Uh, budget transparency, cost efficient audits, which I know the mayor is already working on a lot of things. So it would just be continuing to collaborate um, with her and just uh, looking to really look into like the debt management of the city. Uh, so how how can we um, make sure that we're not in a deficit? How can we make sure that there are reserves um, for the city to make sure that the debt never occurs again? And that is a possibility. Another top priority is the public safety. Um, it's, I believe it's a, a big priority for a lot of people in the community. And um, by, you know, initiating certain policies and working with current policies and how we can maybe uh, be a little bit more innovative uh, as far as like maybe uh, surveillance technology, a little bit more AI technology. There's a lot of different options that are out there. I'm not just going to give my whole hand here. Um, however, there's a lot of things that are out there. Our, our youth programs, the economic um, development initiatives is huge for me, uh, being that also that I sit like I've been on the NAACP's uh, economic development as their chair. So the economy, uh, supporting small businesses, this country was built on the back of small businesses. It, it's not the big corporations that cause a community to thrive. It is the small businesses. And so even some supporting the uh, small businesses and fi figuring out how we can uh, continue to partner with the uh, connections and contracts that we currently have to you know, bring more awareness, bring more attractions to the small businesses here in Pueblo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Flores. As you know, the city council position that uh, that we're filling tonight is nonpartisan. Uh, you take a nonpartisan oath. Uh, what does nonpartisan mean to you? I was ready for that one too. So my, my thing for the nonpartisan, uh, the last time I was just very uh, direct, you know, not leaning to the left, not leaning to the right, uh, but I was just very, very uh, quick on my response. And for this one, I was, I wanted to give a clearer explanation um, and an example just for the record of the nonpartisan view that I have. And that is where you should put your glasses on, Anita. Because I appreciate you asking that question because I feel like that's an, that's an issue with our community. And how do we get past it? How do we get past the, uh, the partisan issues that we have. And I had a whole part here where I wanted to read to you and apparently I am not seeing my own handwriting here. Um, 
but to be nonpartisan. It's not about bringing uh, my Republican views or my Democratic views. It's not about bringing my agendas into the forum, but it's about being able to stand in the middle for the greater good of our community. I want to paraphrase again because I had a whole, I guess it's not meant for me to read all this stuff to you guys um, and take up my 20 minutes. But Dennis, I think that that is very important. So if I was to be sitting on that seat, it's not about an agenda from the West or an agenda from the East. It's not about an agenda from any uh, group or uh, collective of uh, political views. It's about the greater good of the community in a whole. And I, I, I can't say it enough because who are why who are we representing as a city council? You represent me. Whatever district you're in, you represent those people. We represent um, the city of Pueblo, even as a citizen of Pueblo. If I go into another city or to another state, I'm still going in as a resident of Pueblo and I represent this town. So my conduct, my behavior is a direct representation of where I live and where I reside. So whether you're sitting on the city council seat or whether you're sitting out in the pews uh, or you're outside watching television and you never come to a city council meeting and you never get involved with your city, you still represent your city. And it has to be in one word or one phrase for the greater good of all. Thank you. Councilor Meister. Um, the, there was an article in the Chieftain today saying that there's a core request coming out to look at all the applications and everything that was submitted. And there was an accusation of cronyism, favoritism, predetermination. And um, so for transparency for the public, um, I'm asking a question. So there's not a question after the fact when a follow-up story comes out. You know, okay. and so my question is, please explain your relationship with each member on council and tell us if you believe that that re relationship should be a reason they should um, recuse themselves from voting tonight. So this is my personal relationship mm -hmm. with everyone on council. So um, the only, I guess, encounter I have is that Ms. Maestri, you and I are in a leadership class together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an amazing question because I'm going to be transparent. Mm -hmm. My inbox and my email has been lit up this week with, um, with the rumors that were speculated, I guess, that this is rigged and my time is just being wasted because council has already made up decisions and things of that nature. So I really appreciate that being a question that has to be answered. And, um, but I don't have any personal relationships. I don't have any outside engagements, outside encounters with anyone. Um, however, there's what, twice a month that we are in a leadership class mm -hmm. together, uh, Ms. Maestri and myself, um, and we do not communicate outside of that forum. I've never picked up the phone and called her. I've never emailed her. Uh, so I don't have any personal uh, conflict of interest with anyone on the on the panel. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Councilor Latino. Excuse me. Anita, the community is trying to move forward. What are your thoughts about the needle exchange? I am so glad that the city is doing something about it. As a business owner, as a mother, and as a grandmother, and as a person of this community, it is a concern to have access to used needles outside. I have to sweep them up outside my business. I don't support it. Um, those are people's personal choices. And Council Latino, they're adults who are making their own personal decision for themselves. An adult cannot make a decision for a child when it comes to needles. You cannot imprison children 
and confine them to their home or to their own backyard because your fear that they're going to get stuck with something. Those parks are built for children. Our amenities, the swimming pools, the splash pads, those are built for children and for families. And we should be able to go to public places, have our children and our grandchildren run and be free because one day they're going to become adults and life is going to slap them in the face. They need to be able to be children and be free without the fears and the concerns that they're going to step on a needle or pick up a needle. I am so glad that this administration is doing something about cleaning up our community. Pueblo deserves to be better, and it looks like it's on the verge of doing so. So that's my stance. Thank you. And I have the last question, and I was so happy to hear that you've uh, delved into the budget. So the last question is, in what area or areas would you suggest reducing expenses to help alleviate the $13 million budget deficit? <laughs> you want to know my plan, Mark. <laughs> so there are a couple of little areas, um, and this is challenging because even sitting on the CSAC board, there's so many amazing nonprofit organizations here. And there's so much money that the city and the county delves out and helps. And, you know, we've got grants, you've got all these things that are offsetting. One of the things that I would like to see is um, a one-stop shop, kind of. Some of the organizations, like even with the budget and what we're giving out as a city, what gives is given out um, by the county, are going out to multiple organizations doing the same thing. I think that causes a little bit of a weight and a burden financially. If we had an umbrella for mental health, if we had an umbrella, all the services, the people, all the, all the organizations that are working in certain areas coming together and collaborating and working together, then we can alleviate having to spend and send out, disperse out uh, multiple agencies. And that's one area that we could work on. Um, there's not a lot in the city's budget right now of what they're doing that doesn't need to continue to be done. However, I believe the innovative ideas, how can we curtail that? How can we bring it down into a more of affordable way of, of expenditure? Cutting out a lot of things is probably not going to always be the answer. But how can we bring it down into to make some sense? And there are some areas that there are some things that I see within the budget that uh, as I looked over it, it's like, well, you really can't take that out if you're trying to you know, move Pueblo forward, if you're trying to grow. But Mark, I believe that you can sit back and you can reassess. You can um, you know, go over the budget and see what's being spent. I love the, uh, the auditing, you know, getting someone to come in to you know, go over the budget and make sure that the organizations and people are performing the way that they're supposed to and ha having an accountability to the money. And so really that that's where it's going to boil down is the accountability. And then how can we maybe, instead of just uh, completely closing down or stop funding a certain area, just bringing the budget down and seeing how you can uh, offset it with a few little changes. Because the things that are on the budget, the things that are there now are imperative to moving forward. But does it require that amount of money? And then the other area is possibly in the city budget, um, you know, financially being in the financial arena that I'm in of uh, insurance, retirement plans, um, you know, the, the city is matching the, um, the retirement plan of the employees, of the city employees. Now there you can kind of um, offset the budget as well because you can change the city can as a whole instead of having a retirement plan that the city has to match in that budget, you can reallocate that. You can change the type of retirement plan that the city uh, employees are getting to where number one is not as volatile and it doesn't cost the city to match that budget. So how many employees does the city have? How many uh, employees are you having to match their retirement plan? What could you do with that money to reallocate it into the budget? 
to offset. So there's a lot of different things that can be done that should be, um, you know, the panel, the city should be open to just kind of look over and see what would be best for the city of Pueblo and the employees that serve it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's all of the questions. You can certainly stay here and listen to everybody else and go through the process with us. And thank you so much for doing this. That's good. Appreciate you guys. And next up will be Brett Boston. We'll be waiting for him to come up. Well, Mr. Boston, come on down. Your mic is on. Now I'll explain the process to you. So, <clears throat> excuse me, each city councilor turned in two questions. So we're gonna ask you a total of 12 questions. Uh, we have about 24 minutes to get it done. So hopefully uh, it works out and uh, take your time. Answer however you want to answer. You're not on a, a per question time clock or anything else like that. Okay. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Councilor Latino. Brett, welcome. And the uh, question that I have for you is please share your background with us and explain what similarities it has with your role as a city council citywide representative. Uh, so I'm sure everybody looked over my resume. Um, so as you know, I am a CSU Pueblo alumni. I got a bachelor's and a master's there. Uh, I have studied in business administration and business marketing and management. Uh, some of the work I've done, um, I've you know been in management a whole lot in my life. Uh, I've had some stints in uh, some advertising, and then I currently own and operate a restaurant in town. Uh, some of the things that I think that would relate to on council, um, every day I deal with uh, budgeting on a business. I have to manage a monthly, yearly budget. I got to stay profitable. Um, I deal with a lot of customer complaints, employee complaints. Um, I figure out where to best delegate um, wherever help is needed. Um, I analyze issues that are at hand uh, in certain days or certain times, figure out what's the priority need for certain things. Um, when something goes wrong, I try to find a way to fix it. So if a constituent has a complaint, you know, try to prioritize which complaints are the most serious, where there is help available, what things that actually can be provided in this situation. I won't be able to fix it with a cup of coffee or a new waffle, but it'd be something where I can try to provide, you know, an, a resource to somebody or connect them with a certain agency that I think would be able to provide them some sort of assistance. Um, but there's a lot more uh, assets that would be available to try to figure out where to best operate or, you know, point those people in those directions. Um, so basically hearing concerns, uh, figuring out what the biggest concerns are and trying to delegate um, best ways to accomplish fixing those. Um, like I said, budget, a big thing, trying to stay profitable. If uh, I'm not profitable, my business doesn't stay afloat. Employees lose their jobs. Um, things don't go well. So I think those things in my background would probably have the uh, biggest effect on what I would be doing on council. Uh, Councilor Martinez. Hi, Mr. Boston. Hi there. Tell us about why you decided to apply for the at-large seat. Uh, so initially I decided to apply uh, because uh, I kind of had um, a lot of people that are, you know, some of them are in this room now, um, kind of gave me some influence and some, uh, I guess, vision of what is possible when you get involved in the city. Um, so as a lot of you guys know, you were on the previous councils or know me uh, personally for why I started speaking out and got involved in the first place. Uh, I had a huge issue with the drug problem in the city. And that drug problem is related to a lot of other issues in the city when it relates to paraphernalia, litter, loitering, shopping carts, uh, cr crime, theft. A lot of those issues are all centered around drugs. Um, if you know about my location, it shares a lot with the roadway in. Um, I was trying to run a successful business. I have a lot of females that work for me. I have a lot of elderly people that come into my business. I have a lot of children that come. So every single day when I have to, you know, clean up paraphernalia, I have, um, you know, homeless individuals, um, people that are, you know, not in their right mind on drugs, threatening people right outside my property. Um, you know, I had that 
building right up behind me that just was an eyesore. It was causing a lot of issues in the city and it was plaguing me more probably than most people. Um, so I started getting involved. I spoke out my displeasures. I came up with some ideas. I presented arguments. I came up with possible solutions. I brought in proof. Um, so uh, I just started seeing a lot of negative things becoming because of that specific hotel. Um, I was glad to see that on Harriet Heather Graham's first day of office that you guys you know took action against that. I can speak from personal experience and I have hundreds of people that can testify for the same thing. It was a night and day difference from February 1st to February 2nd. We went from having multiple interactions a day, multiple paraphernalia, tons of people loitering. It's It's been less than 10 of each of those things probably since that's happened. You can talk to other business areas and uh, business owners in the area. I've talked to Sean Davis, the, I believe he's the head of the DICE team. He's uh, talked to people. Theft is down, crime is down, calls to service are down tremendously. So seeing the effect that my perspective gave the chief of police and the deputy chiefs, they told me there was a new perspective on an issue that they knew was a problem, but they didn't see it the way I saw it. So giving that perspective on something and seeing the impact that it can have on this community as a whole, I just thought it would be nice to be able to share my perspective on other issues that I think are a problem in Pueblo and other things that I think are good that we can possibly do better. So I think there's been a lot of good things that have been happening, um, you know, over the last couple of years. But I, you know, I just think it would be good to get a new perspective, possibly, and me being slightly younger and having a different background. I think that'd be something that I can provide. I have the next question. In preparation for your appointment, have you read the city charter? Uh, I will say 72 hours was not a ton of time. So I will say that I did not read the entire charter word for word. I did read the city council portion word for word. Here's a good question. Can you describe its importance to, to the role of being a counselor? Um, yeah. So I would say it's basically uh, the biggest thing the charter does is it lays out the, it's basically like a rule book uh, in the most part and how things operate. It's like an operation manual for all city employees. Um, it tells us uh, how ordinances are passed, uh, veto processes, um, the different roles that everybody has, uh, your duties, things that you have to do um, when it comes to how you have to vote on every single thing or you'll, you know, vacant your seat. Um, it basically just draws out all the different things and the professional way to handle those things, uh, different ways to address people, um, wording, things along those lines were the biggest things that I picked up from that. Um, but uh, when it comes to past the city council portion, I kind of definitely just skimmed through most of the other people's jobs, but I did read the, mostly the just the city council part. Uh, Councilor Maestri. Good evening, Brett. Thank you Good for evening. coming tonight. Of course, thanks for having me. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you all very much for having me. Yeah, it takes a lot to come forward. Um, and so please describe the differences between the duties of mayor and council as written in the charter. Uh, so the biggest way I understand it is city council uh, is more so tasked with the budgetary spending and passing the ordinances and pushing along uh, the way you want the city to run, um, all those kinds of things, whereas the mayor more so enforces all the things that we are supposed to pass. Okay, thank you. Councilor Flores. Yes, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, how do you see your skills and personality fitting into this city council dais uh, with us? Uh, well, I would say that I could bring something different. I think everybody on council brings something very specific and they all have a very good strength. Um, you know, Joe's very passionate every time he speaks. Uh, he has a very big passion for the youth. Roger, every time he speaks, he has a very big passion for his district, and he's always trying to do anything and everything he can to help his constituents with what he thinks is a priority problem in his district at the time. Mark, you always bring a very authoritative approach, and you make sure everything stays positive and professional, uh, so, you know, especially heckling in the crowd. That's something that's very, you know, disrespectful, in my opinion, and you keep a very firm hand on that. Regina, you're not scared to back down from your beliefs on anything that you do or anything that you believe, and you always bring a very, you know, set approach on the way you approach things. And I think it's, you know, very good that you stick to your ground. You don't let anybody intimidate you. Dennis, you always really bring a very good research-based background to everything that you provide on council. You always have a very thought-provoked process on anything that you speak on. And Sarah is always very compassionate the way she speaks to the constituents. You always try to connect me with the DICE team specifically with my issues or come up with a solution and hear people's problems. 
Um, even when Heather was up there, you know, she was listening to me from day one and she always provided something of a somewhat solution of something that she could offer me. So when it comes to me, I feel like every day, whether it's an employee complaining about another employee, a process that I have, a customer complaining about something, I think it's always very important to at least listen, to hear what people's problems are and see if there's a simple or somewhat positive solution that you can offer them in the meantime, or at least give them some encouragement that there is something that you can provide in the future that may take patience or time to get to. Um, so I think, you know, having that working with a lot of different individuals, diverse amount of people in the restaurant industry, I can bring, you know, those problem solving skills to people. Uh, I'm a really analytical and database thinker. Numbers come easy to me. Um, numbers have always been something that I was good at. Uh, so I think, you know, when it comes to budget things, I've, you know, always been good with, you know, operating positively in the restaurant, improving things. Uh, so budgeting and analyzing research, database thinking is something also that I take pride in. So doing the research and making a proper decision based on the research that I have at hand would be something that I think I can positively bring. Councilor Gomez. Hi, Brett. How do you approach working with others who have different viewpoints or priorities? Um, so uh, I'm sure everybody has been in the restaurant industry at least some point in their life. There's definitely a lot of different backgrounds or uh, diverse personalities that come in there. So when it comes to everybody having a different viewpoint, I think you got to be very open. You got to be willing to listen. You got to have an open mind going into everything that you do. Um, if you walk into something, having your mind made up, you're already going to have your decision made, how you're going to vote, how you're going to think. Um, that's a big problem that a lot of people have in this current day and age. I think too many people have their minds so far set in one way. They want to be red or blue, right or left, and not so much so, much so right or wrong. Uh, I think more people need to be open-minded to thinking in new ways. They need to be um, able to listen to new ideas. Uh, so I'm always open to listening to ideas and whether or not I agree with somebody, I will always at least hear them out. That's what I always tell my employees. If you have a new idea, don't be scared to approach me. Don't be scared to ask a question. If I think your idea is better, then I'll implement it. If I don't like your idea, I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you the process of what I do and why I do it my way and why I think it's better. But I think it's always important to have open discussion and not just block out ideas because perspective could be everything. And just because you see things one way doesn't mean it's always the right way. Having vision from a different person and an idea from a different person could change the way you view something eventually. Thank you. Councilor Martinez. Tell us about a time that you had to work to build consensus. What were the strategies that you used and were you successful in getting that consensus? Um, let's see. Uh, I would say sometime, uh, you know, I had to work with a lot of individuals uh, when it came to shutting down that hotel. Not everybody agreed with my method or my thought process on how I felt that we should attack that. Um, some people thought, you know, kicking the people out might have been a bad idea. But I think when it comes to doing something that's overall a, a better, greater good, I think that's what kind of brings people together to a common viewpoint. Uh, so I would just say putting forth ideas and in a mindset that would kind of help make people understand the benefits that could come from every side of the situation and make the benefits outweigh the negatives. And that would be the best way to kind of bring everybody together. So I, you know, just I laid out all the negatives that it was causing and I felt those negatives definitely outweighed the positives and eventually they were able to, uh, you know, clean up that problem and it's been a better thing ever since. Councilor Gomez. Right. What are the top three policy issues you believe our community should focus on and how would you address them? Um, so I'd say the biggest thing, like I said earlier, that plagues our community uh, is definitely the drugs. Uh, if you hear the constituents complaints, it, mostly is focused around, you know, homeless. It's focused around unsafe environment, theft, crime, drugs. So drugs, I think, is the biggest thing. Um, the drugs will attack a lot of the other issues, whether it's paraphernalia left on the ground, uh, loitering, unsafe environment, theft, a lot of those issues. Um, so, I mean, there's only so much we can do to a certain extent because we can't change the legislation. We can't change a lot of those kinds of things. Um, but I think a big way to address that uh, would be the police force. Um, 
I know it's uh, not the easiest thing, but uh, whether it may be marketing, um, I know I would talk to Chief Noller myself, and he, uh, I had spoken to several police officers that wanted to do lateral transfers. I told him a lot of people didn't even know we offered a lateral transfer program. So I know they started doing more marketing. Uh, so marketing, trying to make things look more enticing, being more open, making things more available, those resources, showing people what we have to offer, what Pueblo has to offer, uh, would be a good way to help solve those the drug and the police force issue. Uh, another big issue that I think that we might have uh, is events, marketing for the public. Uh, there's a lot of events in the town that a lot of people don't know about, whether they're free, they're price locked, because not everybody has an extra $20 with the way things are in, in the current state of things. Um, I think um, doing more things um, where like a nonprofit is giving tickets to the youth or giving out tickets to entities, you know, to get people more involved in events and focusing on trying to get more events in Pueblo. Cause if you, you know, outbid somebody, you create a more, uh, you know, more youthful environment, you get more of these young people that come to these, you know, the symphony or the plays or things like that. You're getting a new generation involved in these things. Um, it's going to bring in more revenue. A lot of these young people want to go out and do something. And too many people that I know want to leave Pueblo to do a lot of those things. So marketing events better so that people know what Pueblo has to offer would be another big thing and trying to get more of those events, you know, available to people. Uh, would be a big part of it just so that more people don't want to leave Pueblo for everything that they want to do. They More people are willing to do nightlife in Pueblo. Um, so I'd, I'd say, yeah, the, the the drugs, the police force, and events and marketing in Pueblo. Councilor Flores. Yes, uh, Brett, the position that you're applying for is uh, basically a nonpartisan position. Uh, what does nonpartisanship mean to you? Um, so by definition, obviously, it's not having bias specifically in a political aspect. Um, to me, what that means is, uh, as I said earlier, too many people are so focused on right versus left, red versus blue. In my opinion, it needs to be more so right versus wrong. Um, what's best for the constituents? I'd say coming into every single meeting with an open mind, not having your mind made up on a single thing that's going to be read or voted on that night is a good place to start. Um, hearing, have your, you know, formulate your own opinion, do your own research on certain things, have a stance of least where you somewhat stand, but when everybody comes up here and shares their mind, um, when the uh, chief or the you know directors of each uh, staff report comes up and gives you know their their two cents on everything, you got to be open and listen to everything that everybody's saying, and then that way, once you have more information based on the research you've done, like I said, those new perspectives from other people that have a different viewpoint than us, you can formulate opinions that you genuinely think are best for all the constituents, because at the end of the day, we're supposed to do what's best for the constituents. We're not supposed to push agendas. We're not supposed to do what we think is best for ourselves. We're supposed to do what we think is the best for the city of Pueblo. And I think you guys, you know, I respect everything you guys have done up to this point. You guys have a very hard job that a lot of people bash us for. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a hard job and, you know, it's hard to make decisions for everybody. Nothing in life is hundred percent perfect. Nothing in life is hundred percent fair but we have to do our best to try to do what we think is best for Pueblo as a whole. Thank you. Councilor Maestri. Um, Brett, the chieftain this morning um, stated that they were going to court request all the applications, our votes, how we voted, because there was, you know, there's an accusation of cronyism, favoritism, and predetermination of who's going to make it here tonight. So in order for transparency with the public so that we know beforehand, we just would like, I'd like to ask you a question um, to please explain your relationship with the members of council. And if you believe that the relationship should be a reason for them not to vote for you. Uh, so I would say I started getting involved with local politics, mostly in September of last year. I don't think I knew a single one of you prior to then. Uh, I came to council chambers um, on behalf of the idea of Randy Thurston. Uh, he was a candidate for mayor at the time, and I spoke to him about the issues plaguing me and how bad it was. I told him about the issues I was having. Um, he loved my passion. He loved my ideas, and he told me that I should come before city council and speak about what's going on so that people could have that perspective. Uh, shed light on the issues and come up with my, or, you know, bring my solutions that I possibly had my ideas of how to possibly attack those issues. So I came that first night, probably sometime in October or November, I believe was the first time I spoke. So that is the first time I met, you know, Sarah, Dennis, Regina, and Heather was probably that night. 
um, post that night, I think uh, me and Heather had lunch one day. I met her for lunch and we talked about some of those ideas past that. Uh, Sarah, I think I've only spoke to you in these council chambers. Dennis, I believe I saw you at the Paco uh, event that night. Uh, Regina, I believe I saw you at uh, Heather Graham's uh, party and that was the first time we spoke uh, outside of these chambers. Mark, I've only spoke to you inside of these chambers one time uh, when I told you I was going to apply for the seat last time. Roger, I don't know if we've ever even had a formal conversation. And Joe occasionally dines at my restaurant with his son on Sundays. Um, other than that, uh, I've seen him at uh, the PCRP meetings a couple of times, but I do not have any formal relations. Um, I've emailed all you guys once to let you know that I was going to be applying for this position. Uh, other than that, I think I've had one phone call with maybe two phone calls with Regina for probably about 20, 30 minutes, but mm -hmm. I have no other outstanding relationships with anybody here. Thank you. Councilor Latino. Brett, this community is trying to move forward. What are your thoughts about the needle exchange? Um, so, uh, that is an ordinance that has already been passed. Um, I respect everybody's opinions on that. Um, I, I think it was very brave of everybody to come out and share their stories. I think it was very brave of all you guys to make the stances that you made on that situation. Uh, I know that there is a pending lawsuit uh, against the city, um, for that. Um, I think, uh, it would be probably in the best interest, um, you know, to do our best to protect the city in the regard of that lawsuit. Um, you know, we don't want to make sure we do anything uh, negative to harm the city in this respect. Um, do I think it's something that a lot of the constituents have been talking about for a lot of years on both sides? Yeah. Um, if you want me to share my personal beliefs on that, uh, you know, at some point, um, you know, I was picking up a lot of needles. Uh, I would just say that transparency was the biggest issue that I had with the exchange. And that's the key word that came from that program that I saw the issue with was exchange. Um, I know a lot of people, when they voted on it, they thought the idea was give one, get one. Um, I know that it's not 100% easy for everybody to get to the one or two locations that the, you know, there was. And some people were going to the pharmacy or the, the drop boxes, but um, the... Uh, I think it was Clean Up Pueblo came up with that report where uh, they, how many needles they had picked up in the last year. Um, you know, there's a lot that are left behind and uh, it is dangerous. You know, I, I've had to pick up a lot of, you know, bloody needles myself and you never know what could happen. And uh, I just think a lot of people were complaining about it. And when you hear a lot of people talk about going out with kids on, you know, park paths, bike paths, things like that, and seeing needles. It was something that a lot of people were disgusted with. So I think um, in a sense of cleaning up Pueblo, moving, moving Pueblo forward and trying to make an impact on the drug problem or some of the littering problem, that it was, you know, a step in the right direction. And your last Thank question. You. <clears throat> Have you read the 2024 annual budget? <clears throat> and if so, in what area or areas would you suggest reducing expenses to help alleviate the $13 million budget deficit? So, yes, I uh, I did read the budget. It is very large. So, like I said, in that 72-hour period, uh, you can't analyze everything 100%, but I did look at uh, most everything. Like I said, numbers are a big thing for me. So, for starters, personal opinion, uh, you know, I think a lot of government budgets everywhere should try to operate more like a business budget or a household budget. You know, every month, if you're, you know, operating in the red before long, you know, your business is going to close or before long, your house is going to be foreclosed, your car's going to get repossessed. So is it perfect to every time? No. Is it hard to always stay in budget? No. And especially when it comes to good things in government, there's always more things that people want, more things that need to be done, some things that come spur of the moment that are much larger than what a traditional business or household would deal with. Um, so looking at the budget, first thing I notice, over 60% goes towards salaries, payments of staff. There's over 800 employees on staff. By no means am I recommending layoffs or uh, deductions of pay for anybody. But if we're going to dedicate that much of our budget towards one thing, 
that's something that I think we should further analyze. Um, you know, check out job descriptions of every department head, uh, you know, or department, uh, look through there, just making sure we're getting the best bang for our buck. Uh, we're getting the best return on investment. If we're going to be putting 60, 65% of our budget towards all these departments, just making sure that our departments are operating the best that they can. They're providing the best things for the city that are possible. Um, and if they're not, you know, just trying to make sure that we can make those areas operate a little bit better to make sure we're kind of getting a lot more. Uh, when it comes to some things um, such as, you know, nonprofits, I'm not saying that we shouldn't fund nonprofits, but uh, I would say that when people come in and ask for money, we should ask for more transparency. We should ask where this money's going. We should see the benefit that it's having on the community. Like I said, uh, you know, whether it's symphony giving out tickets to the kids at the school so they can come and see the symphony and try to get more of that youth involved, um, you know, tickets to the plays that, you know, go on here, bring in, you know, kids that are, you know, into drama. It's just things like that, that show the positive impact that it's actually having on the community, uh, community, asking for more transparency, making sure a lot of the money that we're giving out to these people isn't just going towards administrative salaries if they're supposed to be nonprofits. Um, and then um, we should probably try to, you know, look a little bit more into some of the work that the chamber could do for us. You know, we give a lot of money to the chamber. Um, you know, I, I would say that there's some things that they could do better. They could try to do more with their events that they have going on, try to provide more free events like Manitou Springs does or something like that to try to get more people into Pueblo. Cause like I said, in today's day and age, you know, not everybody has an extra 10, 15, $20 to go out to some of these events. Um, so just looking at some of those aspects, uh, trying to find more opportunities for grants to fund some of these projects, um, seeing if there's any assistance that we can get federally or, you know, from the state to try to help fund some of the stuff to get us a little bit more money try to look for any incentive-based programs um, to try to help us get a little bit more to help fund some of this stuff. Um, but those are probably, you know, the biggest things that I noticed was the large sum going towards salaries and then nonprofits as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank again, you so much for being a part of this process. Thank you for putting yourself out there and coming here and applying. If you want to stay, you can stay, uh, but you don't have to go down into the, dungeon again sounds good i just want to say thanks again for even thinking of me for this it's a huge honor you know in you know my day and age you know that this day is just getting up here and having an opportunity so thanks again for even considering me and next up will be christopher nickel <laughs> he sympathizes with you. <laughs> you do. Hello, everyone. Hey, Mr. Nickel, thank you for coming and thank you for being a part of this process. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Every city councilor this time has created two questions. So we have a total of 12 questions. We have about <clears throat> 24, 25 minutes to get through them all. Uh, you don't, you obviously don't, <clears throat> you're not on a time clock like we're gonna throw you out of here if you go over a little bit, but we're trying to keep it concise and 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 moving. And with that, we're gonna start with Councilor Latino. Chris, thank you for, for applying for this position. Um, my question is, please share with us your background and explain what similarities it has with your role as a city council, city council, citywide representative. Well, well thank you, Councilman Latino. Uh, my background is in uh, cybersecurity. I'm a graduate of CSU Pueblo's uh, computer information technology program here in Pueblo. And I have my master's degree from Regis in computer information systems. Uh, I uh, have worked in the defense industry in cybersecurity for the last about 25 years now. Uh, during that time, I served on city council for two terms, eight years. I was city council president. I was work chair. I was head of the uh, electric utilities uh, research commission panel. We had a blue ribbon panel. We were searching at uh, looking at different options for 
electric utilities uh, and how to lower our rates. And I was the chairman of that panel. Uh, I've uh, been part of uh, the, uh, the PEDCO group. I've been part of uh, Urban Renewal. So I've had quite a different bit of experience when it comes to city government, worked through uh, formulation of the city budget eight different times. Um, so quite a bit of city experience. While I was on city council, one of the things I like to do was uh, meet with different departments. So I've done ride-alongs with the police department. I've met with the fire department. I've uh, just, if I'm out on the street and I see a city work crew, I'll stop and talk to them and just see how things are going and get an, inf you know, the take from somebody that's on the street um, and and what, what maybe they'll tell me what's going on or how, you know, ask her if I can give them any help. Um, so I actually learn a lot by stopping and talking to people and showing that you care what's going on in the city. So I think that's really important. Uh, so I think I have quite a bit of experience that would lend myself to just being able to hit the ground running. I think that's what's needed right now. Our city is facing a lot of uh, really important issues. And uh, I think I'll be able to jump in and help you guys out and help the mayor achieve her agenda, which is I think really what we need to do is all work together and find common ground and just get Pueblo back on its feet. Thank you. Councilor Martinez. Hi, Mr. Nicole. Hi. Why have you decided to apply for the at-large seat? Well, after doing this for eight years, I had some time off. Um, I feel like there's a real need right now uh, for somebody to come in, as I've said, and really help the council to fill this role. I think, uh, you know, Councilman Hernandez uh, was brave to say, you know, that he had other things that were his priority right now and it's it, he needed to be able to go in that direction i totally respect that uh, but we need some, it's really critical right now that somebody comes in and fills that empty seat and uh i feel like i have the background and i can do that and i can be of assistance to each and every one of you and i think i've you know some of you i've worked with before up there and i think if you think back at the things we've worked on um we have been able to achieve things i'm not somebody that's particularly argumentative. I try to work together with other people and get along and uh, just trying to find the best way to solve Pueblo's problems and work for the good of our citizens, which is, I think, what our job is as city council. <clears throat> My question is, in preparation for your appointment, have you read the city charter? And if so, can you describe its importance to the role of being a counselor? Uh, Yes, Councilman Aleph, I have read the city charter. Uh, as a council member coming in, I think it's critical to have reviewed it and understand it because it comes up. Um, there's definitely times when you, you'll you be on city council and you'll see things that are going on and you realize, I read something about that. It's that we can't do it that way. And you go back and I used to pull it up on my cell phone in the middle of a council meeting if I had to. Um, I actually asked the city clerk to make it a searchable document because at the time the PDF file wasn't searchable and it wasn't usable to be able to find things in a pinch. You had to go start from the beginning and look to the end. So making it a searchable PDF was critical for as a useful document to be able to find specific items and topics that you were looking for in a, in a pinch or in a, even sitting at the dais and trying to get uh, an answer on something. So absolutely, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's very critical. And what was the second, there was a second part to your question. Just describe its importance to the role of being a counselor. Okay, I think I think I've done that. So okay, thank you, uh, Councilor Maestri. Thank you. Gosh, I, and I, Elvis isn't here to tell me that tonight, but that's okay. You're. <laughs> <laughs> um, please describe the differences uh, between the duties of the mayor and of council as written in the charter. So really the mayor is the chief executive officer of the city. The mayor is the comparable to our federal model. The mayor is the head of the executive branch of our city government. So the council will create and pass ordinances and resolutions or laws. And the, um, the mayor's job is to execute that and carry out those duties to operate the operational arm of the city everything from day to day from uh, managing how things are run from public works. Uh, the buck stops at the mayor's office and that's um, uh, as far as being the person in charge, sort of the commander in chief of the city, you might look at it like. 
And with city council, we're the legislative branch. We, one of our primary roles is the passage of the budget, the annual budget. It's super important that we have uh, a budget that's uh, balanced and well-considered and covers all the different uh, services that the city offers. Uh, our former city manager, Sam Azad, used to say, we're a full service city and we offer lots of different areas that uh, other cities don't. And so it's so important that a city council understands that role uh, from a legislative body, which is very different from the executive branch. Uh, but I think comparing it to the federal model is probably the best example I can come up with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Flores. Uh, good to see you, Chris. Nice to see you. Uh, uh, having served with you for four years, uh, I looking, I'm looking at my question. It almost sounds silly. Uh, how do you see your skills and personality fitting into this dais, uh, this council dais? Well, I think um, my personality is one of being fairly um, jovial, and I like to be. I like to joke around a little bit. I think what we're doing is serious business, and it's really important that we take that role very seriously. But at the same time, we have to have a good relationship amongst council. And when we come together, we break bread before a meeting, and we're there. You know, it's it's good to have good relationships. You want to walk in that room and feel like everybody in there is a friend of yours. And and you and at the end of the day, when you leave the building, they're all friends of yours as well. And I get it. We get into contentious debates about a lot of hot topics. But at the end of the day, I can still call Dennis and Dennis and I still have a good relationship and we still are cordial to one another and and um, and Mark Aleph the same way. And so that's how I operate. I I look at this as an important job, but at the end of the day, it's important that professionalism is really important. And um, I think that's one where one, an area where I excel is being able to talk to people, to be able to um, come together and break ideas, complex ideas down into little pieces and we can sit down over a cup of coffee and, and work something out. And I think that's the issue. You have to be able to, to compromise and get things done. If you're constantly just stuck to a certain mindset, it, it doesn't go well for working on a panel, um, whether it's a board of directors or, or a city council. So I think that um, uh, working together as a team is really, that teamwork is essential. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Gomez. Yeah, hi, Chris. Um, how do you approach working with others who have a different viewpoint or priorities? Well, I think the critical piece is listening. Uh, if you go into the discussion with you're always right and your mindset is that you're 100% right every time, that arrogance is what's going to hold you back. And so you have to go in and listen. And when you listen, incredible things happen. You actually might learn something from that other person and realize you don't have all the answers and somebody else may know more or just as much as you do. So, and I think that happens a lot. I'm amazed at how smart our city staff is and how they can come here and present an, a topic that you thought you were an expert on and you knew more about, and you realize that you don't scratch the surface on that. So I think listening is very critical to that, um, to that relationship. And, and so, uh, and then it's about also being willing to, to compromise and work together as a team. You have to realize the end goal is achieving what's best for the citizens of this community. And so sometimes you can get there on 100% on the idea that you're pushing. And other times it's a give and take. You have to let some things go to get there. Uh, but I think you also have to adhere to your, your core values and beliefs. That's important, uh, very important. But um, you have to be able to work and uh, listen and compromise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Councilor Martinez. Tell us about a time where you had to work to build consensus. What were the strategies that you used to build consensus and were you successful? Yeah, I think that um, Electric Utilities Commission panel was uh, the city formed that blue ribbon panel and uh, uh, Councilman Flores and I were on that and uh, um, Councilman Aleph, I believe you were on that. Um, we had to work together to try to come up with ideas for the city uh, to bring it forward for this off-ramp uh, possibility that we were looking at. So we were talking about forming a city utility that would be a city-owned and operated utility breaking away from Black Hills Energy. At the time, we were dealing with all the issues with higher electricity rates, which was something I ran on as a councilman back in 2011. Uh, so being on that panel was critical, uh, but everybody had different agenda. Everybody had different agendas, had different ideas, and so we had to come up with a way to bring forward a, co a cohesive ballot initiative that the people could digest and vote on that made sense. 
And I think we did that. Now, ultimately, the citizens decided they weren't ready to go down that road. And that was the, ultimately up to them and, and the decision they made. But um, how we operated as a panel was really important because it was all eyes were on that panel at the time. It was a very critical issue for our city. Uh, at the time, the chieftain was really writing a lot of editorials. There was a lot of visibility on that whole issue and how it was going to impact the city because it was such a huge issue. So working together as a, as a committee was essential, and I was the chair of that, and it was the, really the first time I chaired a committee like that for a Blue Ribbon panel. And so I was trying to get, and we had pulled the county in on it. So we had uh, Councilman or uh, Commissioner Terry Hart coming in. So it was now a joint city-county panel. So now, you, as you all have experienced working with the county, totally different perspectives on things. So trying to get that group to be cohesive and bring something forward uh, that the citizens could vote on was a real challenge. But at the same time, we were successful and we were able to do it and get it done. And then when it was done, the panel closed and uh, and basically the city retired the panel. But so that would be my example, I think. Uh, Councilor Gomez. Chris, what are the top three policy issues you believe our community should focus on and how would you address them? Well, I think um, right now, and it seems like every time I've run or been involved in this process, uh, those issues have changed over the years since 2011. But right now we're dealing with, I would say, uh, crime and violent crime in our city is a real problem. We're dealing with the problem of homelessness. And I think the third on my, in my view is blighted neighborhoods. We have so many neighborhoods in Pueblo that are old and outdated and have outdated infrastructure, have homes that are dilapidated or, or even abandoned that need to be torn down. And how do we address all, all those three issues I think are the key are the key ones in my view. Uh, those are my key um, issues when I ran for mayor this time. And I think I'll, I'll stick with that as my answer. That's what, those are the three I think we're gonna continue to have to work on as a team to, to resolve. Thank you. Councilor Flores. Uh, yes, uh, what what does nonpartisan mean to you? Well, actually, if you go back to the city charter, uh, the city charter says that we should be a nonpartisan panel as city council. So to me, I think it's very important that we work together in a nonpartisan way. We're not there as Republicans. We're not there as independents. We're not there as the Green Party or whatever party if somebody may be. We're here as city council members. Um, we're here as a mayor of a city. Those are all nonpartisan positions under the city charter. So I think you have to remember that when you're on council. Uh, and again, I keep coming back to you have to act in what's the best interest of the citizens of the community, because that's who we're here to serve. Those are our bosses, in my view. And uh, so I think uh, if you can do that without part of bringing partisan politics into these discussions, uh, it does, really doesn't have a place here in, in this room. Uh, Councilor Maestri. So today the chieftain came out in its article. It stated that they were pulling core requests on all the applications, how we voted as a council to bring all five members here and so forth. And in those applications, there was an accusation of cronyism, predetermination and favoritism. And so my question is for transparency for the public to not get this in a later story after we've already made a decision tonight is to ask each um, applicant um, to please explain your relationship with a member, each member on council and tell us if you believe that relationship should be a reason that they should recuse themselves from voting. Uh, my answer, so the second question is no, I don't think there's anything that would be, be a conflict of interest for anybody to uh, vote on this matter. Um, I think the uh, relationships <laughs> I have with the, I can go through each through each council member is, is how you would like That's to answer. That's how everybody else answers. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Martinez, I've never actually really interfaced with you much. Um, you know, we, uh, since, since my last interview, I think was the last time I talked to you here. So Councilman Flores, um, we have talked a couple occasionally uh, in passing at different events. We were running for mayor. Uh, I would see you at things. Uh, I did call you, and I've I did lobby from my own behalf. Uh, and I have I have uh, I didn't talk to uh, Councilwoman Maestri this time, but I did last time. I called you, mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about 
me serving on council and why I thought we'd be a good, um, we could have a good uh, working relationship if we were our colleagues on city council. Councilman Aleph, I talk to fairly frequently. I see him around at different events. Um, I uh, run into him um, occasionally when I'm out at restaurants. I think I saw you at Mealburger Farms having lunch not long ago. Um, so, uh, uh, and I, I've called Councilman Aleph to lobby on my behalf to say that I think I'd be a good council person and to be fit into the panel. Councilman Gomez, I've known for a long time. I met Councilman Gomez uh, when uh, uh, Sheriff Corsentino was running for re-election, and I met him at one of the first uh, campaign events they had years ago. Um, so I've worked on a number of issues throughout the years, uh, ballot questions, uh, different different committees. So I've known Councilman Gomez as well. Councilman Latino, um, you know, I think we have a, our, our families have known each other for years. Um, uh, uh, when he was running for mayor, I was on the mayor circuit with him and we would talk uh, at different events, I guess. We were camp out campaigning and you were running for city council at the time, I guess is what it was. And I would see you at different functions because we were at the same thing. Um, and so, uh, uh, and I've I've talked to Councilman Latino about this position and uh, uh, why I thought I would be a good fit. And that's pretty much it. I don't think any of that would rec would be a causation for anyone to recuse themselves as a decision maker uh, on the panel. All right, thank you. Thank you. Councilor <laughs> Latino. Chris, um, this community is trying to move forward. What are your thoughts about the needle exchange? Well, I have some concerns about it. Um, when they said one of the things that I was concerned about was the um, when it was rolled out in the community, I'd heard from some of the local businesses in the Bessemer neighborhood that were concerned that they didn't feel like they were necessarily listened to or had an input in the whole process. Um, and there was definitely concerns about how it would impact the business community that in that area that's been desperately trying to revitalize itself over the years in the Bessemer on Northern Avenue there. Um, I recognize that this is a huge issue for our city. We have definitely have a IV drug problem in our city that's uh, that's spreading like wildfire. Um, and it's the causation of a lot of our problems when it look when you look at um, our homelessness and the people that are here. Um, that's evident by the amount of needles that we're finding all over the place in the city. We're finding them in alleys, we're finding them all over Bessemer. I've talked to business owners who are go out and rake them up. One guy has a yard rake like you'd have for raking, raking leaves and he rakes up needles so he doesn't have to touch them. Uh, Councilwoman Winter had a, a cleanup down on Fountain Creek, and I heard that some of the folks that participated in that cleanup were uh, concerned at all the needles they were finding on the Fountain Creek down there, um, just laying out everywhere, which is a huge problem if you if you get a stick. I mean, anybody that works in healthcare knows that needle sticks are like one of the main things they train against on how you handle needles. Uh, I can tell you my son was a student at Belmont Elementary some years ago. He's 22, so it's been a few years, but... Um, and he was on the playground and one of the kids picked up a needle and was chasing him around. And he was um, hitting him with his coat and he got in trouble for hitting the kid with his coat. And we got called into the principal's office and it, uh, they asked him why he was doing what he was doing. And he said, well, the kid was chasing him with a IV drug needle that they found on the, somebody found, they didn't know what it was. I mean, these little kids playing, right? So they just thought it was something to play with. So Councilman Latino, when you told that story about the same thing happening in another school, I totally identified with it because we lived it. We, we experienced that very thing. So I think it's safe to say that that's a, that's a huge risk in our community. But I also think the issue of IV drug addiction is a huge risk as well um, for a lot of people. So I think that the council um, has a right to decide whether we wanna have a needle exchange program in the city. And if the council makes that decision and it passes as a vote of the council majority, then that, zoning or, or ordinance that was put in place uh, should be upheld. So I don't think that um, a group coming in and suing from the outside uh, should be able to dictate what's right for the city. It's it's up to the elected representatives of the, to the, of the city to make a decision. Like any other decision, if the public doesn't like that decision, then they can always, we all serve at the pleasure of the public, so they can make a change. But I think the city council has a right to 
set ordinances and rules that deal with issues such as that. So I think it was a legal decision that the council made. And finally, thank you. Okay. And finally, we're on the last question. Okay. Uh, have you read the 2024 annual budget? If so, in what area or areas would you suggest reducing expenses to help alleviate the $13 million budget deficit? Well, I think there's a lot of things we need to look at within the budget. Um, it's interesting because the budget's really expanded since I was on city council. So I left in the beginning of 2020. And in four years, we, were, we weren't quite hitting 90 million in the budget at that time. And we're over 100 million now. And, um, and so some of that is coming from you know, extra tax revenue, extra property taxes. Um, and I think there's a huge difference in the amount of money when you're at, before you get to 90 million to all the way to where you're at, you know, over 120 million and, and change. So I think we have to, uh, uh, we should be able to have a balanced budget. We have more money than we had all those years. And that was at a time when um, we were doing dealing with some real financial problems with the city at that time. And we were really having to decide whether we were going to fund things like the state fair and uh, some really controversial issues that were groups that wanted nonprofits that wanted money from the city. Uh, and the, and we were looking at how we were going to, what money we could give, whether we could make a loan and, and help the, the YMCA was a big issue back then. Um, but now we even have a bigger budget, a vastly different budget with more money, but yet we're still, having a structural deficit. So I think we have to look for ways to correct that because if you read about a structural deficit in economics, you can sustain it for a while, but ultimately it's unsustainable. You can't just keep operating with a structural deficit. So uh, I think it's important that we not tap into reserves. I think we have to be balanced. Uh, the, the two types of reserves that we have uh, uh, outlined by Tabor and the charter are really important. Uh, and I think we have, should live, be able to live within those because if there is river, river um, think about this, think in the 1920s when we had the flood and what our city went through at that time, that was probably one of the biggest uh, you know, catastrophes the city has gone through in the history of Pueblo. In fact, it almost broke the town. There were so many people that left after that because they were flooded out that Pueblo saw a big decline in population. So um, how would the city react if we don't have our full uh, you know, our full reserves to a situation like that. And that's what the reserves are for. It's for the rainy day when something unexpected happens and you don't, you know, I think probably the recent thing we had was the, the uh, pandemic, you know, how that affected our city uh, would be something in recent memory. But I think you have to have those reserves and they're there, they're in there for a, a real purpose. And that's in case something goes wrong, you've got extra money to deal with something. So, um, so I would say that we need to uh, look at, you know, I don't think you can cut one department across the board. I think you have to look at making small cuts. And we, it's one thing we did as a city council, we were very active working with the city manager when I was on council before and having to live within that budget and really cut uh, different things across the area. So I would look at small cuts across the entire budget. I wouldn't go cut an entire department or, you know, shut down the airport or something drastic like that. I think we have to look at how we can uh, make small cuts that add up and make sense. Uh, I'd also don't think we can be everything to everybody. We can't continue to, um, you know, when we had the money from the federal government that came out of the relief acts that were given, that was a money that we were, the city was given to spend and, you know, we'd be, you know, dumb not to spend it, but, uh, and, and provide projects that to give value to people in the city. But I think we have to be, we're going to have to really pick and choose what money we can give away and what money we need to do, utilize to solve those three core problems, the homeless problem, hiring more police to provide more public safety, getting creative about that. Um, and then also um, dealing with these, these buildings. I look at how long it took to tear down that burned out building behind Vidmar's over the old funeral parlor. Um, and it was up for what, three years or something like that. It sat there with teetering bricks and it was ready to fall over. Um, we've got to be better to be able to handle those buildings that are turning into drug dens and places with, that are, uh, you know, illegal activities happening. Uh, so that's going to be critical. If you're, it's critical if you're going to be addressing those core issues. And I think as a city council, we have to pick what our core issues are. What direction do we want to head? 
what are our common goals? I think as a council, we could figure out five or six things we really want to focus on and then agree to work together to achieve those goals. Um, and there's other things that might be, you know, agendas of individual council members, but when it comes to those, that set of key goals, those are the things we direct budget into. And I think if we did that, we'd be in a much better situation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Nickel. Thank you for applying. Thank you for going through this process. Uh, we appreciate you coming in. You can certainly stay here okay. and uh, go through the process. Okay. Thank you, Council. I appreciate your opportunity and the time. And next up, we have Alexander Magatu. Come on down, and your mic is on, and... Uh, Thank you for coming and thank you for going through this process. We Good appreciate evening, council. you. <clears throat> the process tonight will be that each city councilor has come up with two questions for a total of 12 questions. We have about 24, 25 minutes to get through those questions. Uh, just make sure that you cover them the way you want to cover them and uh, nobody's going to buzz you out. Sure. So uh, we're going to start uh, with Councilor Latino. Thank you. Alexandra, uh, my question is as follows. Please share your background with us and explain what similarities it has with your role as a city council citywide representative. So as a born and raised Puebloan, you know, obviously I have a deep connection with my community. Um, I've been at it for quite a while when it comes to advocating for the advancement of our community. Um, I grew up on the South side. I still live there to this day. I'm a graduate of Central High School. I went to, uh, I had my first jobs in in Pueblo at, at the Target store on the North side um, and the Home Depot store on the North side before I went to college in Fort Collins. Um, that's where I started my business, my sports entertainment business. At that point, I began to finish my, my college career in, in Fort Collins and I said, I know Pueblo. I'm going to go take my hometown by storm. I'm going to go headquarter my business in my hometown. I know the lay of the land and we're going to take it by storm. I get home and I find that I run into a brick wall when it comes to trying to get anywhere with trying to establish a new business. I, I found out very quickly that a lot of things are political in Pueblo and it's, it's difficult to get a business off the ground when you try to move it from from another location. And so that's kind of where I got into politics. Um, that that really wasn't a great move that I wanted to make, but I felt I felt that I needed to because our community needs opportunity. And that's kind of where where my background is coming from. from a, from a citywide representative to to represent the city citywide here, I think there are tremendous opportunities that we have to offer, tremendous amenities that the city owns and operates and uh, residents can make use of on a daily basis, but there's always room for improvement. I wanna be there to help. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Martinez. Hi, Mr. Margatu. Hi. Tell us about why you decided to apply for the at-large position. I think that Pueblo needs new faces. Um, and actually, I got an email this afternoon from a, a, a potential constituent here, kind of referencing the same thing. Um, we need new blood. We need fresh ideas. We need uh, a fresh perspective on city council. And one of the, e the one of the things that the email said was, I'm trying to remember it now, um, the, the rising generations deserve a seat at the table. I believe you're a part of my generation as a millennial counselor. I, I think that we need to drive policy that's going to dictate the future that we want to live in. With all of the growth and infrastructure that's being focused north of, of our community and has been for years, I think that Pueblo has kind of been lagging behind. And, and a lot of that might have to do with, with the leadership that we've been having in recent decades. It's, it's time to move forward. And, and I want to advance our community in a safe way back where um, in, in that particular email, it also said that that uh, 
the constituent could remember a time where they can go to bed with the screen door open, you know, with just the screen door, not locked, not anything. They can go to bed sleeping without any any real danger or feeling like they were in danger that something bad was going to happen. I don't know if we can ever get back to that point, but we can sure try. Uh, the next question is mine. <clears throat> in preparation for your appointment, have you read the city charter? And if so, can you describe its importance to the role of being a counselor? Absolutely. So up until recently, I have not read the city the city charter. I, I have read it in full, and I am now in the process of familiarizing myself with, with every aspect of it. Um, it's a governing document much like the Constitution of the state of Colorado, the Constitution of the United States. There, there are very important aspects in there, like home rule, that I believe very firmly in. Um, to me, a Constitution should be very difficult to amend, but it should be followed to the T. Uh, Councilor Maestri. Yeah. Welcome, Alex. Um, please describe the difference between the duties of mayor and of council as written in the charter. So in, in my perspective here, I think, well, I, I would say in the charter as well, the, the council is responsible for setting the tone of our community, for setting policy. I believe that the charter should dic or dictates that the mayor is responsible for enforcing that. Um, it's it's also important to to understand as a as a potential member of city council to understand really what the true functions of government are and i think that's where we go wrong with the higher levels of government is you know people representatives just kind of have a an idea of what they want to do and sometimes they're good ideas and sometimes they're not uh more often than not though they they are not legitimate functions of government and i think that's where we get into the into the weeds regarding these political battles that we find ourselves engaged in sometimes. Uh, Councilor Flores. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my question is as follows. How do you see your skills and personality fitting into this city council dais? My personality? Your uh, skills and personality. Um, so so my skill set, I, I have a, a a recent reputation here of paying close attention to to the, uh, the the state legislature and particularly the legislation that comes out of out of Denver and and I kind of analyze how that affects my my community and my family. Um, I'm a marketing executive by trade. Uh, I do a lot of consulting work recently since COVID. I do a lot of consulting work for for organizations that are looking for marketing services. Um, when you tie that together, I think that that can be a selling point to promote our community to new industry, to revitalize existing industry in our community. Um, and, and when you combine that with my ability to kind of analyze the, the legislation that comes out of Denver, uh, I mentioned earlier, home rule is a big thing for me. That's kind of our version of the 10th Amendment, uh, you know, states' rights uh, here in Pueblo. And, and I really think that there should be a time where city council should should really flex that muscle uh, a lot more often. Um, we we have a right to do that. We have a right to dictate our own path as as residents of Pueblo, as a as a city council of Pueblo. We have the right to dictate our own path, and that's in the constitution of the state of uh, of the state of Colorado. Um, that's kind of where my skill set is. Uh, I want to sell Pueblo to the future, basically. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Gomez. Alex, how do you approach working with others who have different viewpoints or priorities than yours? Let me ask you this again here, I'm sorry. How do you approach working with others who have different viewpoints or priorities? And the, the mic was to the side. <laughs> I get to do this three times. How do you approach working with others who have different viewpoints or priorities? So there, I mean, I don't expect that everybody's going to agree 100% of the time. There, there's always room for compromise. And 
when you're trying to achieve an objective, especially on this level, to, to make a community a safe and, and welcoming place for, for our residents, but for the people that visit Pueblo, I, I think working with members of council as, as we're looking to achieve here, um, I believe we all have a very similar objective. We all hold Pueblo, our own community within our heart here. And, and we all have an idea of what that community is supposed to be. So I think there's probably more commonality in that regard than the possible disagreement. Thank you. Councilor Martinez? Tell us about a time that you had to lead a group through consensus. What were the strategies that you used to build consensus and were you successful? So we do that. Um, definitely not in the political realm. Um, we do that with uh, in in the uh, the marketing industry. I mean, we we deal with focus groups and uh, we try to bring forward an objective for a, a specific client. We try to bring forward the objective that the client is trying to achieve here. That doesn't always happen. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the client will decide whether they want to move forward with the project or not. And at that point, if if the client does decide that we want to go through the, with the project, we move forward with the marketing plan and we build a consensus with our team through focus groups, through surveying, um, polling the community that it's going to affect, uh, going to affect the most. And that's basically marketing generally isn't a one man game. It, it is a team effort and and perspective comes from a lot of a lot of areas here and it's important to to focus on that and take all of that into consideration when you're moving something forward uh councilor gomez Got this time alex what are the top three policy issues you believe our community should focus on and how would you address them so again, through through my skill set, I think that uh, one of my biggest priorities is focusing on what legislation comes out of Denver and how it affects our community. So take, uh, I believe it was a couple of years ago when when the legislature po uh, passed that massive crime bill that that really set the tone for a lot of the crime that we're seeing in our communities. And the city council, rightfully so, took at that time took the uh, the initiative, and I, I feel like they leveraged home rule at that time to um, reduce the uh, the penalty um, the the victim of uh, the victimization threshold from two thousand dollars to I believe it was like two or three hundred dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's a pretty big gap that the legislature said you can victimize somebody for up to two thousand dollars before we arrest you. The city council said we don't. We don't want that here. We're gonna we're gonna take action and we're gonna amend it. Even though that was a very small portion of that piece of legislation, the 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 city council took the initiative to kind of protect its citizens from uh, above and beyond what the the original piece of legislation set forward. So how how would I achieve that? Again, I would flex our muscle under home rule. Um, if it's if it's a negative impact for Pueblo. I would work with you each and every one of you guys to make sure that we create a solution to that particular problem that is a good fit for Pueblo. Uh, Councilor Flores. Yes. Uh, what does nonpartisan mean to you? Nonpartisan is, is what I wish the world would be. Um, having been a partisan for so long in my political careers, uh, in my political career, so ever, and, and it hasn't been a, a a very noteworthy career in in politics here. I think that the the partisanship and the divide. I mean, we we tend to argue over the most ridiculous things sometimes, and being nonpartisan. I, I really think that that partisanship is the root of all of our problems, in especially in a community like Pueblo. Uh, where we're so heavy, heavily dominated one way or the other. Um, now we have one side trying to take credit, saying that they turned the, the community toward their perspective. And it's, who cares? Um, all I care about is Pueblo and, and moving Pueblo forward. Thank you. Sure. 
Uh, Councilor Maestri. Uh, Mr. Magatu, the chieftain uh, came out today and they said that they were running a core request on who voted for who here at, on council to bring five members here today. Um, and in and they're re requesting all of our the applications and so forth. And in um, that process, there was a uh, accusation of cronyism, favoritism, and predetermination. And um, for transparency reasons for the public purposes for I mean transparency purposes for the public, could you please describe your relationship with each member on council? And tell, tell us if you believe that your relationship should be a reason to recuse yourself, um, for, uh, for any of us to recuse ourselves from voting for you tonight. Sure. So uh, duh, let's start easy. I've never personally met uh, Councillor Martinez or, or Councillor Flores. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with you, not necessarily anything over uh, governing politics or um, city council or anything. And, and in fact, there was actually, a, in the interest of transparency, there was actually a time where you and I kind of butted heads. Uh, so um, it is what it is. What it is. My my acquaintance with, with Mark Aliff, I know him from years ago. Um, my involvement with, uh, my involvement in politics, um, you just tend to meet people. Uh, when when you're involved in politics at the level that I was, um, Mark and I, I consider Mark uh, an acquaintance. Um, we we can go out for coffee sometime. I mean, any of us can go out for coffee sometime, and I'd be happy to do that. Uh, as as far as Mr. Gomez, I met him several years back, um, 2009, 2010-ish. That was about it until he got on council. Um, then we started talking uh, guidance of our community, you know, moving moving our community forward. I believe he has a deep passion for that, as, as again, I think we all do. Uh, Mr. Latino, I met him, what, maybe two years ago. Um, we, we say hello in passing, but we never really sit down to have a, a conversation or or engage in in any kind of dialogue. Uh, again, I look forward to doing that with the, with each of you. Should you be interested in doing that, I look forward to doing that if we're working together as colleagues. Thank you, uh, Councilor Latino. Alex, this this community is trying to move forward. What are your thoughts about the needle exchange? Um. So that we're asking a policy question here. We're asking a question in terms of how you personally think about the needle exchange, what you personally okay. think about it. So, so I personally do not think that the needle exchange is a worthy endeavor. And I certainly don't think that we should be putting the taxpayers on the hook for that. Um, needle exchange. I remember there was the, the issue with the, the dirty needles, piles of them in in our city parks near our our ball fields um places where our kids go to play even the schoolyards at, at times in in my research and engagement on the issue it's a 50 50 whether a needle is actually exchanged or not um i think i read a report not too long ago that there were there were uh a hundred thousand needles that went unexchanged. And I think that just goes to prove the point. So, so my big thing is if, if somebody wants to do a needle exchange program, go for it, but don't put Pueblo's taxpayers on the hook for it. Thank you. And the last question, Alex, <clears throat> have you read the 2024 annual budget? And if so, in what area or areas would you suggest reducing expenses to help alleviate the $13 million budget deficit? So I have not read the budget, no. Um, we're, we're talking about a deficit here and, and not a debt, which is on the surface, that actually is a good thing. 
because a deficit, understanding the difference between a deficit and a debt is very important. You know, a, a debt is money you've already spent. A deficit is money you want to spend. So I think that prioritizing uh, our agenda here to, to the most important things that we need to fund is, is one way to go about doing it. Now, to, to fill in the shortfall here, there is some discretionary spending that goes out. And, and of course, um, we, we have committees and boards, community committees and boards that look at those, uh, at those uh, spending items to um, see, where, see what uh, organizations we would like to fund. Pueblo has needs. You know, we need to finish our roads. We need to finish the projects. I know you guys are going to be talking about uh, the, the easement project uh, later on tonight. We have a lot of projects that are that are underway. And one of my biggest pet peeves as a resident is we start these projects, which Lord knows we need to start them. But, but a project that should be taking, you know, seven, eight, 10, 12 months ends up taking seven years to, to finish it. And that's that's just unacceptable. So I think a lot of our, our issues are really centered around prioritizing the things that are most important. Um, obviously, discretionary spending is going to have to be a, a big part of filling it, filling in that deficit, filling in that shortfall there. Uh, not everybody's going to be happy when you do that. Being on city council, being being a representative, I mean, these are tough decisions to make but they need to be made for the, the betterment of our community. Alex, thank you so much for applying for the position, putting yourself on the line and coming out here and doing this. Uh, we're going to adjourn for... Yeah. Hi, so yeah. Um, if I can pass out the post-interview focus tool for um, council to fill out again, as they did last time. And then um, after, once the break starts, I'm uh, happy to collect those. And while we switch over from the meetings... Okay. Sounds good. That's great. And then we're gonna we're gonna break here till for about ten minutes, so everybody can go to the restroom and whatever. And then we'll get back to our regular meeting. Thank Thanks. you for having me.